Um, this morning I want to talk to you about a message that the Lord has laid on my heart for such time as this, uh, this brand new year, first Sunday of the new year. And I would like you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter number 6, verses 4 through 9. And then we'll skip down and read 20 through 25. And uh, I need to probably move it along because uh, second service at 11 o'clock. So here we go. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart, and you shall teach them uh, diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Now let's skip down to verse number 20. When your sons ask you in time to come, saying, What is the meaning of the testimonies, uh, these the statutes and the judgments which the Lord our God has commanded you, then you shall say to your son, We were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out. Are you with me? We were slaves of the Pharaoh in Egypt. Now that is uh, a symbol of you and I. Uh, I'm going to show you in a moment. We were slaves of the Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders before our eyes, great and severe against Egypt, Pharaoh, and all of his household. Then he brought us out from there that he might bring us in. So he brought us out that he might bring us in. Now, my word to you today is he has brought us out of 2012 that he might bring us into 2013. And if you made it, you've got a purpose and a reason for being here. Amen? So no sense in trying to continue to live in 2012 or 2011 or 10. Some of you are still living in 1979. Right? But anyway, uh, he said, Then he brought us out from there that he might bring us in to give us the land which he swore to our fathers. I want to tell you something. He cannot give you that that he has promised if you want to live back there. He could never give them the promised land if they wanted to live in Egypt. And there are those who say to me, Pastor, I want what God's got for me, but I don't want to. Man, this new modern age. Well, God cannot give you something for today while you live in yesterday. I know it's scary. Just hang on with me. He said that he swore to our fathers, and the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for, uh, for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. Then it will be righteousness for us, if we are careful to observe all the commandments before the Lord our God as he commanded us. Lord, please add your blessings to the reading of your word today. Lord, let my words be sharp. God, let me say only what you'd have me to say, no more, no less. Lord, I'll give you the praise and the honor for it in Christ's name. And the church shouted, Amen. God bless you. Have you ever begun a prayer with this phrase, Lord, please get me through this? <clears throat> I'm telling you, God will get you through in order to get you to. He gets you through in order to get you to something else. People think, well, if I can ever get through this, it's all going to be hunky or No, it ain't. He's going to get you through that. You're going to have a little break, and then you're going to go through something else. That's called life. <clears throat> so bring me out, O oh Lord, of it might be an unhealthy relationship. It might be an addiction problem. It might be a meaningless, mundane job. It might be a destructive habit that's ruining your testimony and your health. It may be emotional pain. It could be financial debt or ruin. It could be spiritual confusion. But you start a prayer and say, Oh, God, please get me out of here. God brings us out in order to what the Word said, bring us in, and to bring us into something greater. The great type of salvation that I mentioned to you is the exodus from Israel. In theological schools all over the world, they agree upon the fact that, that the exodus from Egypt is, um, it is a symbol of our exodus from sin or from Satan's snare. As Israel was brought out of, they were delivered out of Egypt's bondage, 
So likewise, God wants to deliver us from the bondage of sin. Now, um, but I want to tell you something. There were a people. There, you know, nearly 600,000 men uh, came from Egypt. But I want to tell you something. Because of going about things a new way, doing something different, can I tell you a large amount of those people would rather go back to Egypt and make bricks for Pharaoh than they had uh, go on and, and be in a land that is free and a land that is theirs, a land that flows with milk and honey. They would rather be comfortable in what they knew rather than to go forward with what they did not know. You know why? It requires faith to do something that you don't know. Are you hearing me? And we live by faith. We're supposed to walk by faith. Mo listen. After 40 years, Moses prepared the people to possess the land under Joshua. It was only going to take 40 days for you scholars. You know that. But Deuteronomy, it's a collection of messages here. He repeats the law for them. He makes statements that is vital for us to understand about our own salvation history. He says, God brought us out of Egypt. Talking about them. He brought us out of Egypt in order to bring them into the promised land land. Now, I don't know about you. I would rather, if I could choose bondage or promise, let's see, does it take a rocket scientist? Do you want bondage or do you want promise? I see a few folks back there and I ain't sure. I, I don't know, Pastor. You know, I believe God would rather me suffer for him a little while. And now, listen, as we come into this new year, we need to reflect on what God has brought us through. That's why we did the video vignette. We, we can see what God brought us through. There were some great triumphs. We broke ground on the new church this year. We set three all-time tithe record breakers from the whole history of the church, exceeding $40,000 in a month. Uh, just unbelievable things that God has done. Um, and, and now we had some, some tough times as well. We saw the passing of Brother Tom Bell, one of our great uh, members of the church and dear friend of all of us. And uh, and we miss him, and I think about him every week. And uh, so, but, but I need to rejoice because I know he's on the other side. Amen. Give the Lord praise. <laughs> Jesus said, I've come to give you life, and I've come to give you life to the full. But you see, when God takes something, he always gives us back something better. Did you know? That's what a sacrifice is in baseball. You know, you go for it and you hope it works, and you give up and out to get a run or to get advancement or, or whatever it is. Um, and when God takes something from us, he gives us something back. We don't always understand it as we should yet. But I'm going to tell you, uh, where there is an ending, there is a new beginning. For he is the God that makes all things new. Now, you might be kind of at the end of your rope. You might be like the high school teacher I heard that was applying for a job. And as she applied for the job, she got down to a place on the form where it said, Have you ever had a nervous breakdown? She was so stressed out that she wrote, No, but watch this space for further developments. <laughs> I thought maybe she was pastoring or something, but nonetheless. What do we learn from, uh, or, or what do we want to learn from life? I'm telling you, are we willing to learn something from the experience of the Israelites as they entered into the land of promise to possess their inheritance? Since, since God brings us out of negative situations in order to bring us into better situations, in order to bring us into a new experience with Him, here, here's the difference. Can I tell you something? Here, here it is in a nutshell. You've got to get this. In order for God to bring you out, I don't care what it is, if it's drug addiction, if it's infidelity, if it's a marriage that's gone bust, if it's a church that's killing you, whatever it is, for God to bring you out, you've got to be willing to go. You've got to be willing to go. And if you're not willing to go, you're going to sit right there. And now, my definition of vision somewhat differs from some, some folks that I've read of lately, but my definition of vision is the dissatisfaction with the way things are. Because it is only when you get dissatisfied with the way things are that you'll do something about it. When you get fed up with falling through your front porch because you won't replace the boards, finally you'll go down and get some wood and replace the front porch. 
when you get so dissatisfied with, with going up to your ankle, and worse than that, when your wife went down to her ankle, you probably got motivated to go to Lowe's. Because you were dissatisfied. Vision is the dissatisfaction of the way things are now. So listen, uh, what, what, what must we do in the light of what God has done? Since all of you are here, you are in 2013, whether you know it or not. Some of you need to wake up and realize that. But we are in 2013, and since you're here, what must we do in the light of that? Speaking of his deliverance from last year, he's delivered us from our past. He's delivered us from the dilemmas of last year. And yes, you know what? Some of those things are going to follow you this year. You know, God doesn't do social promotions. If you, if you took a test last year and failed it, you're going to take it again this year. And, and, and with brand new opportunities, brand new possibilities, I, I believe that you've got to come to at least four understandings. Let me share them with you. First of all, when God delivers us, I'm not talking about just from last year, but whatever we're delivered from. When God delivers us, now you've got to get this because um, the last generation wouldn't have gotten it. I'm, on, I'm not going to tell you what generation I'm speaking to since there's several represented. But uh, what, when God delivers us, He expects us to develop. He expects us to develop. Can I tell you this? How many educators do we have in the house? Let me see your hand. If you're an educator, you, you work in, in education, school, somewhere. I'm going to tell you something. You know what every educator's goal is? Is to see that student develop. They want to promote them to the next grade level, whatever it may be, but they want to be able to say, last year you were working here, next year you're going to be working there because you are going to develop. You're going to learn to add and subtract and divide and multiply and later on to factor and functions and all the things that must take place in your developmental process. God does not want you just to say, well, I got saved, and that's good, praise God, because you're not going to hell if you got saved. The thief on the cross... He accepted Jesus. He didn't have time to develop anything. Are you with me? Because he was on his way out. But if we've got time left, we need to be developing. So when God delivers, he expects us to develop. See, the deliverance of Israel from Egypt was a great event, but it did not develop their faith. Let me show you. You see, if we, don't, if we won't develop uh, just because, you, you know, you're not going to develop just because you've been delivered. I could take you <clears throat> to the hospital and, and, and we could say, okay, this lady has just delivered this child. That child has been developing, you know, given everything uh, being normal, has developed normal uh, while in mom's womb. The umbilical cord is attached and the baby's nourished and, you know, the prenatal care and the vitamins and all of that, you know, moms do. And, and the baby has been developing and they've been, they got evidence. They say, sonograms show us. You see these little limbs and you see the gender and you see this, you see that. Oh, man, they're developing just fine. And, you know, you're 40 weeks and right on time and the baby's born. Just because the baby has been delivered out of the bondage of a womb does not mean, nor does it ensure that baby will develop. There better be some loving parents that say, you know what, usually they're the first ones, and you know the <clears throat> doctor gets them and spanks them on the behind or whatever, and they start crying, and everybody starts crying. They hand the baby to mama, and she forgets all the pain, and then she starts crying. And, but, but they make a commitment to raise this baby and to nurture that baby and to develop that baby. And when you take that baby to the doctor, they put a measuring tape around his head and say, well, he's developing. You know, they, they measure from top to bottom, and yep, he's right on target or whatever. And they're saying, how much is he drinking? How, or how much is she drinking? Are they going to the bathroom? like this? All of these things, they are charting the development of this child. If something stands out to them and they say, this baby is not growing like he needs to grow, or she, they're going to alert mom and dad. They're going to say, we want to do some tests because this baby, see, we don't do this in the spiritual world. We say, well, praise God, the guy saved. All of them going to be T.D. Jakes next week. And it just ain't going to happen, right? You expect that they just develop. No, your babies didn't just develop either. You got up many nights in the many nights and many times in the night, and you mixed up bottles. And if you were smart, you mixed them up before you went to bed, so you could just sort of stumble to the kitchen and find them, right? And uh, you you prepared yourself for these things. 
right? But many nights you, you stayed up with that baby. Many times you took them to the doctor. Many times you done again and again and again. And then you took them to Little League sports. And then you took them to dance and drama and all of these things. So to educate them, to develop them, so that when they get to a place called college, they've got some baseline knowledge of life. And then they get developed even more, and then they go on and hopefully exceed what you have done in life. That's my goal, anyway, that all of mine do better than I've done. So listen, but they're not going to just develop. They, they, <clears throat> they, they fail to learn the lesson of the exodus. They thought because God delivered them, everything just comes natural after that. God has given some of us great deliverances, but it is up to us to pull our boots on and say, okay, God, what do you want me to do? They complain constantly. They rebelled against the leader that God gave them. Listen, we need to grow up. Notice Hebrews 4 and 2 real quick. In Hebrews 4 and 2, we're going to find, he says, For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. Can I tell you something? I can preach the gospel. All that saying is, is you can hear it and get inspired, but until you in faith start working, you help to no avail. Notice the next scripture with me, Hebrews 5 and 11. Well, I ain't, I ain't no way I can read uh, ours. I can't read all that. Let me just go on. Uh, we need to get out of that quick fix mentality. Let me tell you what the scripture does. I want to paraphrase for it. He said there was times where you should be a teacher already and you have need to be taught again the very rudimentary things of the word of God. I sometimes I look around and say, man, I really need to use somebody. I need to pick somebody to put in this department. And about that time, they start showing themselves. And I say, my Lord, I think I could use that person. All of a sudden, they turn my world upside down. I can't use them there now. Y'all with me? Say amen or oh me. Development involves being intentional. It involves living life on purpose. Now, so uh, what I said was that he has brought us out to bring us in. He brought us through to bring us to. So he, he expects us to develop. Now, notice this. Promises need to be possessed. You've got to understand something. I, I want you to see God has given us eternal and great and precious promises. Would you agree? Say amen. Some, of, uh, some people have identified over 7,800 promises of the Scripture that God has given to us. Paul says the promises of God are yea and in Him. Amen. Thank you, scholars. The word amen comes from a Hebrew word for faithfulness. To say, amen's, to say amen simply means that I first of all acknowledge that God's word is true and that I agree with it. And secondly, we pledge to be faithful to His word as we live in an obedient life unto Him. So an amen, so let it be. I agree with God's Word, and I agree that I need to be faithful to God's Word. See, I want you to understand something. God's promises are not decrees, but they are opportunities. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to unpackage this for you or unwrap this for you. See, we confuse prophecies with promises. I want to straighten it up. If God prophesies something, it will definitely come to pass. But watch this. It is a sovereign declaration of God, uh, of what God will do by His power. Now, but a promise, you see, that, that, that's a prophecy. A declaration, a sovereign declaration of what God will do by His power. Now, uh, a, a promise must be received by faith. And we must obey the conditions of the promise. Uh-oh. See, in other words, sometimes God says, I'm going to do thus and so, and he makes promises to us. We, we, we're the recipient of a lot of promises of God. There's no doubt about it. Now, promises, watch this. You must be willing and obedient. Um, you must receive them by faith. They must. The conditions of the promise must be met. If we are indeed willing and obedient, then we will eat of the best of the land, according to Isaiah 1 and 19. Many of God's promises are never enjoyed because we fail to lay claim to that promise by doing our part. We sit on a bump of do nothing and say, well, God said he was going to do it. And he would have if you'd get up and say, okay, God, what? Oh, I'm going to give you a good example. I can just feel that reverberating, so I've got to get with you. When he got ready to deliver them out of Egypt, he told them what to do. They had to walk out. 
Are you hearing me? He did not send Black Hawk helicopters in there and somebody to angels to load everybody up. I'm going to deliver you. No. Nope. They had to walk out. I heard a story, and you've heard it. It's probably tired by now, of a guy that was fell overboard in the sea. He's lost. There he is. He don't have no preserver. He has nothing. He prays, oh, God, deliver me. And it's not long. A helicopter comes. He lowers a man down in a basket. You know, he's got this life preserver. He says, please get on board. You know, see, he says, no, go on. God's going to save me. So he goes on. You know, what long a merchant ship comes by, and they see him out in the water, and, you know, uh, they get on a bullhorn and they talk to him and they get ready to throw him this ring and he says, no, 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 just go on, God's going to save me. And so it's not long another personal watercraft comes by, somebody, and they say, hey, sir, man, you, you, you know, you're tired, you're weird. I, I, let me help you get on this, get on my boat. No, 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 no. go on, God's going to save me. Of course he died. He was a fool. He died. He gets to heaven and he says, uh, I just want to know why. Why in the world you didn't save me? You said he's going to save me. And the old story says that St. Peter says to him, I sent you two boats and a helicopter, and you wouldn't get on either one of them. You've got to be willing to do your part. Hello? So, now, I, I need to move on. Claiming the promises takes faith and patience. Listen, uh, faith and patience. I've learned that. Oh, my Lord, have I learned it. The promises of God. See, we play a part in the victory. Everything does not just come out of heaven like manna falling on the ground. Now see, that's a different story. When the Lord said, I'll feed you, all of a sudden the bread fell out of heaven like dew. And they just got it and ate. And then complained about that. They moved this light bread. Well... What I'm saying is, God delivered them out of Egypt, and once they were delivered out of Egypt, they wanted to go back. They would rather live in bondage than live by faith. The first generation failed to do what they needed to do, so they spent 40 years in the desert. See, God's promises have to be possessed with faith and with patience and with obedience. And if not, then the promise has been forfeited. Hello? I know a promise that came to Adam one day, and the evangelist called him out and said, he prophesied to him, it's a promise. Whatever you let your, put your hand to do, you will play skillfully for the Lord. He plays skillfully now. But I'm going to tell you something. There was hours and hours. What that promise meant was that, Adam, if you'll just try, I will anoint you. Some of y'all thought that he'd come out of the womb playing like this, and he didn't. Y'all with me? But what God is saying is, listen, I know your heart, and I promise I'm going to do this if you'll do that. And God says, all right, I promised him that. He's walking in it. Here's my anointing. Here's my giftedness. Here's my blessing. And God's telling some of you, uh, he's made promises to you. I'll do this if you'll do that. And you still sit there and wait and wonder, well, what is God going to do with me? What is God going to do with me? God says, get busy, and I'll show you. Wow. Um, man, I need to move on. So, um, now you've got to understand something else, too. Not only do we, uh, uh, the promise has to be possessed, you've got to understand this, that Notre Dame probably ought to be listening to this right now, but how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. They're probably going to need more than that little inspiration to help them. But anyway, one bite at a time. You see, you got to understand something. When we got ready to do the church here, and, and I have people, man, I've got people that come to me with big, lofty dreams. I have people come and say, Pastor, you only got one time to do this, and you know you got to do this right. And, man, if I wrote down everything they wanted, in fact, I even told some of them, I said, you know what, if you'll give some of that money, we'll do it. I did. I said, do you know what the dream you got cost thousands and thousands more dollars than, than have been allocated? I'd love to do all those things, but we have to eat the elephant one bite at a time. And when God, so here's a mistake, that, and I made it too as a youngster in the Lord too. When God promises me something, we see the big old promise, and all of a sudden we think we can digest the whole thing at one time. 
can't do it. You know, the Bible says, do not despise the day of small things, little steps, baby steps. Huh? We hold Micah up right now because he wants to walk more than anything else. He wants to stand up. He wants to stand up. And if you're around him long, you're going to stand him up. That's just how he is. Or he's going to cry. And so, but, but he's, he's got to take some baby steps. It won't be long. He'll be sprinting. Right? But listen, possess the promise a little by little by little. God told the people of Israel, possess the land little by little by little, or else the project will overtake you and you will fall. If you're not careful, you bite off too much. You can't chew all that. Are you with me? So then start small. As a pastor, watch this. I, I, I've often had ideas that were very good ideas. Great, grandiose ideas, if you will. Creative ideas. But I have had to learn some things. There's no way in the world I can do all that I can dream in a month. It's a slow, methodical process of trying to bring this online and then bring this online, bring this online, and eat the elephant one bite at a time. Are you with me? Say amen. Listen, there's nothing wrong with thinking big. You need to think big. There's no doubt about that. We, we've got to think big. But we've got to understand we cannot. You know, you know you've got to do it one step at a time. It's like a big project. If you've got to paint your whole house, which I did this last year. Thank God it's gone. You've got to paint your whole house. Don't think about, oh, man, i got to paint this whole house. Think about, i got to paint this section of this wall before lunch. <laughs> we worry about that section after lunch or whatever. If I can get these columns knocked out, huh? if I can get these painted, if I can get the front porch done right, then we'll worry about the side of the house tomorrow or something. In other words, you'll overwhelm yourself if you try to do everything at one time. Okay. Now, so you do want to think big. Listen, God told Moses if they tried to do too much at one time, the wild beasts would attack them. And I'm going to tell you something. If you try to do too much at one time, you're going to get discouraged and just quit. Just give up. Oh, Revelation. That is why some of you that are in college that are smart enough to take more than 12 hours... And we do have one or two in the church that's taken 21 hours in the semester. And the reason, the reason you've got to get everybody and God to sign that form is because they're scared you're going to bite off too much at one time and can't do it and flunk out. Are you with me? That's why they're wanting to make sure. Are you sure you really want, you really want to do this because you ain't going to do nothing else for this semester? Now, you've got to know something else. You've got to know that enemies are still going to have to be defeated this year. We have not arrived because we made it to 2013. We've not arrived. We're going to have an Extreme Makeover Series starting next week. It's going to be awesome. I'm looking forward to it. And when we get our makeover, you know, whether it be the building, be the home, and I don't want to get into all that. I just simply say we have not arrived even then. There will be times when you're going to have to, you still got to fight. Are you with me? Watch this. The Israelites faced giants in the promised land. What a paradox. God gives us a promise that has giants in it. God says, I've given you, now for us, God has given us some great things in store. But you know what? There's giants to be defeated there as well. We face obstacles to every goal. We battle the sin nature. We battle the world. We battle the devil. The, you see, the gift of faith is free. Did you know that? The gift of faith is free, but the life of faith is a fight. God gives us that faith, but to live in faith and to walk in faith and to hold your head up when everything is looking bad. And to continue to believe in God when everything around you is crumbling. Man, I've been there a few times in my life, and that's a scary place to be. And then at another point, it's an awesome place to be. So, uh, but we're going to have to, that gift of faith is free, but the life of faith we've got to work at. The key to victory is to keep fighting. You cannot quit. You see, you don't lose a battle until you give up. And when you give up, then you've lost the battle. If you keep fighting the good fight, you will win. 
You'll be victorious if you keep on fighting. See, God told them to inhabit the land. And to be witnesses of him to those who remained in the land from the other nations after the conquest. You see, it's not enough to be against something. You've got to be for something. I remember growing up in the church. Very few people could tell you what we stood for, but they could tell you that we don't do this and we don't do that and we don't go here and we don't go there. Now, all that wasn't necessarily bad. But why couldn't we at least say, we do believe in this and we believe in that and see it on the positive side instead of the negative side? Now, God told them to inhabit the land and to be witnesses. You see, it's not enough to be against, but you've got to be for. Too many people are, of faith are always talking about what they're against and what they cannot do instead of what... God has given them freedom to do and liberty to do. Man, time is getting by. <clears throat> Winston Churchill motivated his troops with this statement. The people of England at the height of the World War II, when Nazi forces was facing, uh, threatened to destroy England, he says to them, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. Victory at all costs. Victory in spite of terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. For without victory there is no survival. We shall not flag nor fail. We shall not, or, or rather, we shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. You cannot give up. And last but not least, here's another understanding. When you possess the land, you better remember <clears throat> not to forget the Lord. The great caution to the people. He said repeat, repeatedly, Moses told the people when they crossed the Jordan River and possessed the land, do not forget God who brought you this far. Listen to me. I, I have... Um, go ahead and stand with me I, as I say this. I have prayed with men that was opening businesses right here in these altars years ago. I come to the church, we had about 15 people. Of course, I wrote a newspaper article and a lot of people show up the first day to see who the new guy is. I think we had 55 of course, by next Sunday, you only have 30 again because they saw who this person was. <laughs> but anyway, when we had those kind of numbers, 30, 40 people, I had a man come to me one day with a business card. He said, Pastor, I want you to pray over my business card. He said, I'm just believing God will help me. I said, I'll believe with you. I prayed with this gentleman. God blessed him. God blessed him. What long he was doing work. Uh, for bigger companies, he was a, a sub of his own. But he was doing. It wasn't long after that he was doing work for the government. His company began to grow. He was doing well, and then he forgot God. When he forgot God, he ended up losing everything he had. He ended up losing his wife. I mean, his children. Obviously, they were growing up, but still, yet when you lose your your family, you lose the family unit. Lost his business. Lost his reputation. Here's the deal. Don't forget God. Don't forget God. He said, otherwise when you eat and you're satisfied and when you build fine houses and you settle down with your herds and your flocks and you grow large and the silver and gold increases and all that is multiplied, then your heart becomes proud and you forget the Lord your God that brought you out of Egypt and out of the land of slavery. He led you through the vast dreadful desert, the thirsty waterless land with venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of the rock and gave you manna in the desert to eat something your fathers had never known to humble and to test you, that in the end it might go well with you, that you may say to yourself, that you may say to yourself, my power and strength in my hand have produced this wealth for me. In other words, when you forget God, you'll think you did it. Some of you right now are living on prayers that grandma prayed, that, that daddy prayed or somebody, because 
Listen, everything I have is God's. Everything I have, it's not mine. And the moment that I think I built it, the moment that I think I own it, is the time where God says, I'll just slide it out of the way and let him realize. Can I tell you something? He says, but remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. And so confirm his covenant uh, that he swore to your forefathers as today. Can I tell you words spoken 3,500 years ago still ring true today. Prosperity might be a greater test of your faith than adversity. Everybody runs to God when they get in trouble for the most part. And that's okay. But when you really get doing well, the most people don't feel like they need God no more. So sometimes prosperity could be a larger test than adversity. What I'm saying is this. Do not forget the king. I'm going to close with this illustration. In a Berlin art gallery, there's a painting by German painter Adolf Menzel. He died in 1905. There's a painting that's not quite finished. King Frederick the Great is artistically portrayed as talking to his generals. In the center of the painting is a section etched in charcoal outline indicating the artist's intention to paint a person. But the artist died before the painting was finished. He had painted the background and the generals first, but he left the king till last. He died before he painted the king. Today his work of art is a contribution of a man who forgot the king, who omitted the king. Let me say this. I don't care where you are in life. If you forget that it's God that brought you where you are, you're on your way down. Can we pray right now? I don't know about you, but I want 2013 to be the greatest year of our ministry thus far in life. I want to see more people come to know Jesus in 2013. I mean, we've looked back and we had great victories. We had some that went to be with Jesus. We had some adversity. We had some triumph, victories. But in 2013... I'm believing that God is going to do some of the most awesome things that I've ever seen. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed, let me say this. Some of you that have been tiptoeing around with God, you're going to commit yourself to Him. Some of you are going to commit your life and everything you are to Him, and you're going to see your life change. You'll see your businesses grow. You'll see your hobbies expand. You'll see God just do some things the relationships, you'll find that people want to be around you rather than avoid you. I'm just believing right now. Please understand that this this new year comes with, with good and bad. He brought us through to bring us to. So what is He bringing you to? I pray now, Lord, I pray for everyone standing here. I wish I had time, Lord, to personally talk with each one, but I don't. And I'm asking, Lord, right now that you would touch them. Lord, you brought us through in order to bring us to. You brought us out in order to bring us in. I'm praying, God, right now that you would touch your people in 2013 and that we would see the awesome hand of God in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated for just a moment. Jordan is coming to make the announcements. Extreme Makeover begins this Sunday at 9.30 and 11, and you don't want to miss it. Um, they would love for you to stop by the Connection Center and pick up an invite card to give a friend, waiter, co-worker, and this will make it easier to invite someone you know. Also, Kids Connection begins this Wednesday, and it's going to be awesome. And also, um, Josh wants all the parents of the students who are going to the Ford Conference to meet right up here after they wrap up the service. And if you're a first-time guest, Pastor Mike will be standing out at the guest central following the service. And he would love to meet you and has a gift for you as well. 
Thank you so much. I'm going to close in prayer and be dismissed and just ask every parent if you've got a student, Thug Student Ministries, we've got a little information for you. Father, Lord, we love you this morning. We're just so thankful, God, that we're able to come into your presence, God, and to call upon your name. God, Lord, there's none like you, Father. And Lord, we can search for all eternity, Father, Lord, and never find anyone close to you. God, I pray that you touch every heart and soul here today, Lord, as they go, Father. Lord, that we would tell people about you, Father, Lord, we would make your name famous. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.